Today we're talking about double portion of God's love. Now I know a lot of people think, well, double portion, immediately you think of Elijah and Elisha. Elisha wanted a double portion of the prophet Elijah as he was taken up in the chariot of fire. He wanted to receive that double portion. In fact, he'd been asking him about it and he said, man, you're asking a hard thing. He said, I don't even have that choice. So whenever, you know, Elijah went up in that chariot, Elisha was kind of throwing a little tantrum and all of a sudden come floating down as the mantle from Elijah. He took that mantle, went over to a brook of water as all the other prophets who had been following Elijah was standing on the hilltops watching to see if he had the stuff. Well, Elijah took that mantle and watered it up, took it and struck the brook of water and it opened up, parted for him to cross. They knew he had it then and that's where most people think there's the double portion. Well, let me just say something. A lot has changed since the days of Elijah. <laughs> and, you know, Jesus has made some prerequisites that really change a lot of the difference that we see now between the prophets of the New Testament and the prophets of the Old Testament. And this thing that we're going through now is something that really uh, is just overwhelming. It's really just, I mean, mind-boggling is what God's getting ready to do. But he can't do it with those who are not in love, and I say in love, I'm talking about the love of God, not our own personal human love. That's that's not really as rich enough as what God wants. In fact, you know, out of all the power gifts that we see in the New Testament, they're, they're useless, God says, because I don't even know you. Even if you're healing people, casting out demons, prophesying, whatever, if you have no love, it means absolutely nothing. Love is the more excellent gift. It is the gift that makes everything else work and work for you too. And we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about that because I'm going to switch up on this for you a little bit, going from the Elijah story, from the power, from the fire, calling fire down from heaven and all that, to something that maybe you never really considered. But love of God is a very, very strong thing to possess. It is the very magnet that draws people to you. It is the very thing that people know is true. They know that you're real. They know you're not plastic. You're not just puffed up. That you really do have a love of God working through you. In fact, years and years ago when I first started in this type of ministry and, and I didn't know exactly what to do, so all I did was just pray every day. And one day I was in prayer walking around in the sanctuary of the church at 5, 5, 5.45 in the morning as I do every morning, even on Sundays. And I'd been praying, asking God to see the stuff. Lord, I want to see the power. I want to see the gifts. I want the gift of this, all nine gifts. I want this. I want that. You know, just want, want, want. And then after about three months of that, God said, you want to see the stuff? I said, yeah, yeah, I do. I do. I want to see the stuff. He said, then love my people the way I love them. I thought, wow, man, I took an account of myself, and I realized I don't have that. So I changed my prayer to, Lord, help me love the people the way you love them. And from there, everything else became history. And I began to see the power of God working. Now, I'm going to carry that forward into another level of our life that we can really anticipate, expect, and perfect. And that's the love that God gives us for the opposite sex. <laughs> now, that was, like I said, it's going, to, it's going to turn a corner here, corner, and I'm turning it pretty sharp on you, so don't fall out of the wagon. The thing is that as you begin to look for somebody, because we're talking about finding a mate, or even if you're already married, then maybe things need to change to make it better, because it can always get better. There's room for improvement for everybody, including myself. But I am blessed to be able to have God give me not just one wife, but two women that he has so appointed to be my wife. Now, I told you about Andrea last week, Savannah's mama, and she was a, a, a woman after God's own heart. That's, that's about as much as you sum up. I think that's actually on her tombstone, if I'm not mistaken. But the thing is, is that God put us together, and she put it in a way that was very unique, very confirming, and, you know, there was a lot of things we went through. And if you don't know what that was all about, look at uh, part 16 of this series 22 and you'll find out what I'm talking about but today I want to talk to you about 
what happened when I, after I lost Andrea. She passed away when she was 50 years old, very young. And that left Savannah in kind of a mess, you know, because she was a teenager and she needed her mama. I didn't know how to do all the housework type things that, and uh, Savannah just told me here on the chat, she said she it is written on her tombstone, so I thought it was. You know, and, and so we didn't know what to do. We were really in, in peril. We didn't have a clue of how to take care of the house. We didn't know, we don't know a lot of things. So I called up my my favorite aunt, my God-fearing aunt, my aunt that actually was more effective in my life than my stepmother. And then I also called up my mother-in-law, Andrea's mom. And I called them both and I asked the same question. I said, do you think that I might need to get a nanny to help me raise Savannah? Oh, they thought that was a great idea. <laughs> so that made me feel real confident. But the fact is I did need help. And so what happened, I, I thought, well, where do you find a, a nanny? You know, I didn't know. So I couldn't find anything on Google. So I thought, well, I know what. I'll go to one of those Christian dating sites and I'll put it up there what I'm looking for. Maybe there'll be somebody there that's looking to be able to have a place to stay and help me raise this daughter, you know. And, of course, you know, God will always have things worked out you don't even know about. And, of course, he's working on something I don't even know about at that particular point in time. But I didn't plan on going and getting married again. You know, I'd been, I had so many marriages that were so bad that they just fell all apart because they weren't a God. And yet here was, you know, looking to find a nanny. I just wanted to find a nanny. I didn't want to find a wife. So, you know, we tried finding somebody and really wasn't doing too well. But there was this one picture on a uh, one of dating sites that I just kept being drawn back to. So I sent her an email, and she got back with me, and it was Debbie. And she says, where do you live? And I said, Texas. She said, oh, that's too far. You know, I said, wait a minute. I only live five miles from Oklahoma border. Where are you at, Oklahoma? Okay, well, you know, that shouldn't be a problem. Well, she gave in. She relented. One thing led to another. And we went, we finally got to have a picnic together. And I wasn't feeling too good. In fact, I was really concerned about what Savannah would do if something happened to me. And I'd been torn down pretty hard from trying to take care of Andrea for three and a half years and still working the ministry and taking care of everything I could. So I wasn't doing all that well. And so she just basically told me, you know, you need to go get some help. <laughs> I thought I thought she was brushing me off, but she said she wasn't. Later she told me that. But it went by about, oh, I don't know, five months afterwards. We hadn't talked to each other and called or anything, no emails. And then on May 10th, a tornado came through Oklahoma. And it tore up a bunch of things, a bunch of towns. And uh, I, so I, I didn't know. I thought, well, that's that's pretty sad. You know, I wasn't really thinking about Debbie. And then all of a sudden the Lord said, call her. Find out how she's doing. And I thought, well, Lord, wait, wait a minute. I, I don't think I want to call her. I think she kind of pushed me away. I think I might be intruding. I don't want her to think I'm a stalker or anything. I said, I'll email her. So I guess I made that compromise with God. And he, he allowed me to do that. So I emailed her. The first day went by, no reply. The second day, no reply. The third day, I finally got an email back, and I thought, okay, well, what's going on? She said, yeah, my house got hit by the tornado, and uh, call me. And so I called her up, and I made arrangements to go up to Oklahoma, up, and we picked up a, we were going to pick up a backhoe and front end loader so I could go move some trees out of the way. There was high line wires down. She had 25 acres there, and there was all kinds of damage on the property. The house was damaged pretty badly. And she had been staying in a hotel there in town. So as she was, I pulled up in the drive, and I was going to wait for her to come out. And she come running around the side of the house. <clears throat> she was wearing a purple blouse. I remember that. That's her favorite color, by the way. Everything she has is purple. So anything that I find purple, I try to buy her, whether it's a brush or a mixer or a blender or whatever. And so we, uh, she's come running around that corner. I'm sitting in my truck, and all of a sudden the Lord says, there's your wife. And I thought, what? There's my wife. I thought, okay, well, I'm not going to tell her that. <laughs> sure, she'll be running right back in the house. So we went and picked up the backhoe, got a lot of work done that day. One thing led to another. And, um, you know, we were we really knew God was doing something here because she was in a situation where she needed to sell her place and move on. So she wound up uh, having one of her daughters and his her husband and their boy move in the move into the house and start taking over payments and got it fixed up and they eventually sold it but 
you know, things kind of worked out. She moved in, and I, I already had booked a, a meeting in Hawaii uh, in 2010, and I'd already had that book before I even got back with Debbie and talked to her, you know, and found out all the way God was saying. So, and and I'd always take told my daughters I'd take them to Hawaii on their se senior year. So uh, it wasn't quite Savannah's senior year, but I was going to take her, and we were going to go to Hawaii. So, well. It just turned out that, you know, Debbie, I asked Debbie, you said, you want to go to Hawaii? She said, well, I've never been. She said, you know, let me think about it. And so she talked to some of her friends and decided to go. So I, we got on the plane. This was back in, I guess that was like, uh, I think that was July. Yeah, it was July of 2010. And so while we're on the plane, flying that eight-hour flight to Hawaii across the big pond of Pacific Ocean, uh, I had already picked up a ring, and I was going to ask her to marry me. You know, that's what God says she's my wife, so, you know, so be it. And uh, I didn't know what her response would be. And when I was even buying the ring, the jeweler said, well, what are you going to do if she says no? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. He said, you can't jump out of that jet, and I don't think your parachute will help you at all. I said, no, I guess I'll just have to sit there and, 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 and just kind of console myself. And he said, we kind of laughed about it anyway. So when we got on the plane, and we had been on the plane for a while, I got up and went to the back part where the, the flight attendants are. And there's oh, about three or four of them back there. And I said, look, here's what I'm going to do. I'd like to do this. I want to propose to that girl out there that's sitting by me. I want to ask her to marry me. And I was asking if y'all could help me out a little bit. And they, oh, yeah, they got all excited about it. You know, they thought that's great. They'd never seen that done before. And so... We're coming into Hawaii after they already came by. They gave us champagne, which we weren't going to drink it, but they gave us champagne. They brought by free earplugs, and they did, I mean, ear earbugs, and just a bunch of other stuff. And people are looking at us like, who are y'all to get all this free stuff? You know, and even Debbie's starting to get a little questionable about it. And so anyway, they we're, we're getting ready to come in for a flight. So I thought, oh, well, I, I get, they said they were going to announce it and everything. And I thought, well, maybe they're not changing their mind. Because they already had us all buckled up ready to land. Well, <laughs> whenever we got to the, about, I don't know, we were already putting down the landing gear. One of the uh, flight attendants runs up and gets hold of the microphone. He says, now this is not uh, a safety practice or anything. In fact, this is a violation. But I need everybody to take off your seatbelt, stand up, turn around, and look at roll 46. And so everybody started taking off their seatbelt, even Debbie. And she stands up to turn around, and she realizes, well, wait a minute we're row 46 when she turned back around i was on my knee in the chair <laughs> and i had that wedding ring out and i asked her to marry me well everybody was excited about that and and she accepted and i was excited about that uh didn't make me look bad in fact when we went to get our luggage at the luggage area everybody came by you know congratulating us and it was it was kind of neat and uh so anyway, we had, I think, eight or nine days we were in Hawaii, so we got a lot of time. We I had one meeting in one church, and the rest of the time, we traveled. we put 510 miles on my uh, friend's car that let me have a car to use because I knew the islands. I'd been there a number of times, but I think that was my 25th trip over there. And so I took them all around to the places that the tour bus doesn't go, and we had, we had a real good time. But my point is, is that when God's in something, Everything falls in place. Everything works out. And there was enough confirmation of those things that I knew this was God. I'd seen it before, and I knew that he was doing something here that was going to really work out for the benefit of the both of us and Savannah, too. So as we were in the process of trying to figure out, you know, how we we're going to work all these things out, she informed me that she had fibromyalgia and rheumatoid arthritis and uh, double scoliosis. And I said, she said, if you need to change your mind, you know, that would be all right. I'd understand since you've already been through a lot with your last, late wife. And I said, well, I thought about it about a split second. I said, well, no, no, God said, so that's, that's, that's not even in the equation. That's not a determining factor at all. Well, after we'd been married about a year, I was sitting at the computer one day and an email came through and so I opened up the email and it said that this church had been praying coming against arthritis uh, rheumatoid arthritis and uh, they said we're going to have a service on Sunday night and we're going to be praying for everybody to receive their healing we've been praying a week for against rheumatoid arthritis I thought, 
wow, that's pretty cool. So I looked up where that church at, and it was about 220 miles away. I went in the house. I said, hey, girls, how about let's go to Russ, Texas for an evening, Sunday evening church service. We're going to have a healing service. And they said, where is it? I said, Russ, Texas. And they said, where's that? And I said, I don't know. I said, but if they got a hotel and we got find a room, let's let's just count that. That's God's way of showing us we need to go. So we called and we found a, got a room and it was a real small community there. And so we we get up there and um, walk in the door. And as soon as we walk in the door, the pastor meets me. He says, "Hello, Prophet Simpson." And I said, "Oh, how are you?" He says, "I know you. You don't remember me." And I said, "No, I don't remember you. I, I'm sorry, but I, I guess we met somewhere along the way." And Oh, I guess it was maybe a year or two later. I did remember being preaching at at a little place that he was trying to get a church started, and uh, now he now he was uh, uh, the church had bought the state uh, hospital there in that community, and they had received it for a dollar, bought it from the state for a dollar, and they turned it into a church and also a school with dormitories, um, which was kind of interesting. So that was Robert Corbell and his wife Lisa. Now Lisa came to. Debbie, while the praise and worship was going on, and started praying with her. And I could feel the anointing. I asked Debbie, I said, you feel that anointing? She said, I don't feel anything. And so I could tell something was, you know, cooking there. And then Lisa called for her dad, and he came up behind Debbie and started praying for her, holding up his hands. And um, then all of a sudden, Debbie goes out in the spirit. And <laughs> she's laying out on the floor. And, uh, of course, everybody's, you know, there's a lot of people laying on the floor. A lot of people were getting healed. And so when she got up, you know, I said, did you did you feel anything? She said, no, I just passed out. I don't know what happened. So we, I counted it that she got her healing. I didn't hadn't seen the evidence of it yet, but I just pretty felt pretty confident. Now, that on Monday morning, we got up, and uh, we went ahead and started going toward um, back home. Now, Debbie had to wear these braces on her arms to cover her wrist because she— couldn't really maneuver very well. In fact, she couldn't pick up a pot of water off the stove. She couldn't undo the bottle cap on a bottle of water. There's a lot of things she couldn't do. Her arms just wouldn't let her do it because she had fibromyalgia and rheumatoid arthritis. So she was pretty much dysfunctional on doing a lot of things. So we helped a lot. Well, she got in the car that morning. We started heading home, and she she didn't have her arm braces on. I said, "What? where's your braces? She said, well, I didn't feel like putting them on today. I said, you didn't. <laughs> I thought, that's kind of interesting. So we're driving down the road, and all of a sudden she picks up a bottle of water that hadn't been opened yet and, and cracks that thing open and starts drinking. I said, you know what you just did? She said, what? I said, you just opened up your own bottle of water. She said, I did. I said, I think you got healed. I, she said, I think I did too. She was still weak from wearing those braces. I don't know how long she'd been wearing them, but for a while, a few years maybe, a couple of months at least. And so as we got back to the house she started doing more and more and before long she got our strength back and she hadn't had any problems since now not only did she get healed of rheumatoid arthritis but also fibromyalgia which is a very painful nerve uh disease that causes a lot of pain she said feel like when you just touch her she said it felt like you just drive a knife through her you know it's just that painful which is kind of strange and for those who don't have it or never experienced that that had to be a painful thing so it really changed everything because, you know, that could really make you, a person make the decision to go a different way rather than getting married to someone who had all these issues. But God had already had plans made to take care of her. In fact, a couple of more years went by, and we would, went to another church, and that's a long story to figure out to tell you how we got there. But uh, it was all for other purposes, but we got to that place, and then uh, Debbie wound up you know, being a lot of pain that day from her son, we'd stop by to see him, and he grabbed her and gave her a big old bear hug. He's a big old boy. He picked her up and lifted her up off the floor. Well, having that double scoliosis just really put her in a lot of pain because it kind of put her back, back out and her ribs out. And so we had an appointment with a chiropractor, and the chiropractor started looking at it, and he said, wow. He said, well, you know, that, that, that well, first what happened, we went to church, and we went to that church in Venita, Oklahoma, and, uh, during that service, they it was kind of interesting because uh, the gal that was ho holding the service was from Bethel, uh, Redding, uh, California, and uh, Elizabeth Reinsinger was her name, and she had, had delivered a message to the congregation, and a Baptist group had come in, and they filled up one whole side of the church, and all everybody else was on the opposite side. 
So there was an aisle right up the middle, and you got Baptists on one side and Crazy Maddox on the other. And so she's she's talking about miracles and, and uh, talking about Peter and how he had walked down the roads and just his shadow, when people would lay out on the side of the road, put their people who were paralyzed or whatever on the side of the road, when his shadow would pass them, they'd be healed. So she said, to, she says, tonight I want to know how many people have never seen a, a miracle. Well, near the whole Baptist side raised their arm. They said, they had, you know, and she says, okay, well, how many people here tonight are in pain? Well, a lot of people were in pain. She said, well, how many are on level six or level seven, level eight, level eight, you know? And, of course, by the time it got to level 10, I think Debbie was the only one who had her arm up because she was been really hurting all day long. In fact, she'd been in tears and pastor had paid for. A lot of people would pray for her. Nothing was happening. So she says, okay, I want everybody that that has pain, that needs needs a miracle in their life, come lay down on the floor right here in front of this altar. Well, you know, we didn't really want to go lay down on the floor because it's just too hard to get up. So they let us sit on the steps at the altar, and she had the lights dimmed, and they had one little spotlight that went right down over the top of the, the altar there. And so all these people are laying there. She said, now I want all you people who have never seen a miracle, I want y'all to all line up right alongside, just stand up right in front at the feet of these people laying here on the floor. And she said, when I tell you, y'all just start waving your arms real slow across them. Let your shadow of your arm go across their bodies and watch, see what happens. Well, when all that happened, you know, I, she's praying and she's talking and they, these people are moving their arms back and forth. Now, I'd been driving quite a few miles, been pulling a trailer with that truck of ours and and i been doing a little too much. My old hip was really hurting. So I asked the Lord, Lord, can you take care of my hip? That sure is hurting sitting here on this hard floor on these steps and immediately the pain went away out of my hip i thought wow that's pretty pretty neat so i, I thought i'd reach over and check on debbie so i said i didn't say anything to her i just reached over and, and you know her spine was like an s well i felt jesus just put his hand in my hand and i and i took my fingers two fingers index finger and middle finger and went down her spine to find out where those out of line places were and then i took the side of my hand just the outside palm of my hand, and I started moving it. I'm moving her spine over with it, just very gently moving her spine over. I'd run my fingers down again, make sure it was straight, and if there was somewhere out, I'd just move move it again. It's like working, you ever take some Play-Doh and roll it out and make it like real long cylinder, and you can move that any which way you want to. You can make a ring out of it, you can make a snake out of it, you can do whatever you want to. Well, it was kind of working with a piece of Play-Doh, her back. It was so limber, I, I was amazed. And then I got thinking, well, maybe I'm just imagining something here. So when she asked, Elizabeth asked everybody that had a testimony, anybody want to come up and share? One lady jumped right up there, and she was sharing her testimony. And I said, Debbie, you want to share your testimony? I said, first of all, I said, did you feel what I was doing to your back? She said, yes. I said, could you feel your back moving? She said, yes, I did. I feel it move. I said, are you okay now? She said, yeah, I don't feel any pain now. I said, great. I said, you want to get up there and testify? She said, oh, no, no. In fact, she'd be on camera today if if she really wanted, really enjoyed doing that kind of thing. But she's really not interested in being on camera, so she's she's kind of listening in today, as she does every Sunday. And so I said, "Well, if I get up there with you, can you let me tell us what happened?" So she said, "Yes." So I got up there and I shared what what God had done. Everybody's excited because most everybody there knew she had been in pain all day and in tears, and now she looked totally healed. And she was. In fact, when we got back to to Gainesville, we measured her, and she she was uh, an inch and a three quarters taller than she had been before. So you know, it even straightened her back, made her made her taller. And uh, we went to her chiropractor there in Oklahoma before we got home, and she already had an appointment made for him. And he checked her out. He said, "What have you been doing? You you been on some kind of different machinery or something? What have you been doing that getting you working on your back?" And she said, "Well." Uh, nothing. She said, "Can't you won't tell him?" I told him. He said, "Well, praise God, you've been healed. This this is amazing." He had been a chiropractor for years, so we came back on to Gainesville, and uh, had an appointment with the, the chiropractor here, who's one of our family partners actually. And uh, he looked at her and said, "Wow, this is amazing." He came going, "Wow, this is just your back is just straighter than it's ever been before." And he, so finally, she said, "You won't tell him what happened." So I told him he he stood up, praise God. Because she'd been healed. And, you know, it's kind of amazing what God will do. But my point is this. Double portion. 
A double portion can work in a couple that has the love of God working between them. If you have God working between you, you don't have any problems. What God puts together, no man can take apart. And I've been fortunate enough to have two special women in my life that have been godly women, wanting to serve God, loving God's people, and wanting to serve with all their heart. And, you know, that's, that's, you, can't, you, can't, you can't go find that just on your own. God has to lead you to that type of relationship, into that, that type of relationship that becomes something more than a relationship. It becomes a body of one. So you're working on a double portion because there's many times Debbie's prayed for people when we've been in churches and they've been healed. Some have double scoliosis, some have fibromyalgia, and also burns, uh, bone spurs. She's prayed for people. So she's discovered a number of things that God's given her power over. And there's many times where we've been able to find God together. We pray together. Uh, but the main thing is the power source of it is love. When you have God's love working in you, you've got a double portion because there are two of you doing it for sure. And there's times it seems like it quadruples. It becomes a mega power of God to do things that needs to be done, take care of people. And so with that said, I want to just let you know that God's really in to people finding the ones he has for them. And it doesn't, and it's obvious that it's not just one only because I've, I've been fortunate enough to have two. So it's just a matter of finding that one God has already selected, already preordained. And one thing that Andrea said when she was a young girl, you see, she didn't get married until she was 32 years old. And, and that was really hard for her to go all those years seeing all her friends get married and all her family get married. But one man in the church told her, he said, now listen to me. He said, I know you're worried about that, but you need to start praying for the man God has for you right now. Not praying to get him, but pray for him because he's probably going through all kinds of stuff. And if you keep praying that way, you'll intercede. You'll start seeing some things in their life. You'll start knowing something about them. So when you see them, you'll know who they are before you even really know them. And so she did that, and that she kind of got rid of her list that she had, but then it kind of worked out that uh, everything worked out perfectly. So my point is also is this, and this is going to take you on another, I'm making another turn here, so hold on to the wagon. We're fixing to turn into something totally um, not different, but on a much larger and more grander scale and level of love, marriage, and brides, and grooms you know the Lord God speaks of us as a bride we are the bride of Christ right I believe you can agree with that and if we're the bride of Christ then there is a marriage taking place in the midst of us there is something taking place that that God is very jealous of that he wants to come to live within us to make his abode within us to live within us and you know, the, it, it, I'm going to say this one thing about marriage. Marriage is not classified to be bonafide by God or endorsed by God just because it was in a church. Marriage of God is different. It doesn't even necessarily have to be performed a service by a pastor or a priest. God looks at marriage at a totally different level than we do. It's not because you got a piece of paper that says you're married. And I'm going to read a verse of Scripture to you, and I think this will speak for itself, but if not, I'm going to help you along with that. In John, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 16, it's the woman of the well story, and most everybody thinks of the woman of the well. They think of she was thirsty, and God gave her a, a drink that would last forever. She never thirst again. And uh, they think a lot of things about this. But there's something underlining in this verse of Scripture that really does resonate on a level that we all need to hear for this day and time. Jesus said to this woman at the well, she says, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one whom you are now have with is not your husband. In that you have truly spoken. Now, if you really want to know what Jesus is saying to her, we must focus on the fact 
that he knew she was shacking up with a man now and had at least slept with uh, five other men prior to that. Now, what that says is the Lord looks at it that just when there is that act of intercourse, I'm going to just say it, there's, that's what God perceives to be marriage. That's what he sees as married, as you've, you've now taken yourself on a husband or a wife. And I can remember back in the 60s, I was a teenager, that, you know, somebody was going to go live with somebody that they weren't going to be married. It was taboo. I mean, it was really frowned by the society of people. That was something you just did not do. It was trashy. It was unacceptable. And over the years, society has changed its tone. Now they say, well, it's better to go live together for a while to make sure it's going to work. <laughs> well, what, what kind of synopsis of solutions is this? I mean, this doesn't make any sense to me because you're going to go live with somebody for a period of time, and if it works out, then you know, no, then you know it's okay to get married. That's not what marriage is even all about. It's not about convenience. It's about the love. And the best way to find somebody that you know is of God is look for the love of God in them, not for the lust of God. <laughs> I mean, people get married for the wrong reasons, right? But if you're looking for the love of God, and how you look for the love of God in somebody, well, how do they treat other people? How do they think about other people? What, what do they express? Do they have a lot of anger, a lot of hate? Do they want to hurt people? Do they want to you know, do bad things? Do they have vengeance on their mind all the time? Are, are they repentive? Are they forgetive? Do they forgive easily? Or do they admit their guilts? I mean, there's a lot of things that you can look at to say. Just go to, you know, Galatians 5.22, and those are the fruits of the Spirit, and those fruits of the Spirit are a good God list to go by to judge whether this person's really got the love of God in them. Because if they don't have the love of God in them, it's going to be a rough ride. I don't care what piece of paper you got. I don't care how big the church is or the chapel you got married in. If you don't have the love of God, you're going to be hitting some pretty hard bumps along the way, if even staying in together. And, and I know that from experience. I'm just saying it from experience. I'm not trying to criticize anybody because i got more mistakes than y'all. I've messed up more than any of you. So, you know, don't think I'm trying to look down at you. I'm not. I'm just trying to help you fix what you have already have and get around what you – and keep from getting into something that you don't need to have. And that's, that's really what it comes down to. A lot of times I'm doing prophetic counseling that deals with that very thing. People who are looking to get married and they don't know if they're making the right choice or not. There's some things we can go through to find out. And the main thing is to find out what God has to say. And speaking of what God has to say, let's go to what he's going to say today in this latest prophecy that he's given that I want to share with you to give you what he has to say about what's next, what we can expect. And this has to do with, I'm going to, I'm going to explain this as we go through this, because really you need to hear it um, from a standpoint that gives you the opportunity to be able to know inside and out what God's saying here. And it'll, it'll be a lot easier for you to understand it whenever we get to that place where you can um, I can read it to you, but it won't do any good in, unless you can really understand what he's saying. So let's look at this. God is about to take one huge step forward against his enemies. Now, this is dealing, first of all, with the coronavirus that we're dealing with now, that we're about to come out of. There's a lot of things that have happened that's brought us into this place that we're now having to uh, try to exist in. A lot of people lost jobs. A lot of people lost their businesses. A lot of people have suffered in this in many different ways besides all the people that have had to go through this disease. And some have lost their lives, almost 40,000 in the United States alone. So let's see what the Lord has to say to this. Those, to those who concocted poisons with the attempt to take the breath out of my people, you have failed to meet your mark, falling short of your deadly expectations, not seeing bodies piled up in long graves, 
Your future attempts will also fail, for my people know your wicked plans. Their wall will hold and will not catch them sleeping. On the wall stand watchmen with shofar in hand, ready to sound the alarm. All will hear as the seers make it known to sound the alarm. Now they're talking about a second wave coming through, a second type of virus coming through here. He's also talking about it that we'll be ready for it, we'll be able to defend it, and that he's, God's going to reveal this to many different prophetic people so they'll know in advance of what's coming and when it's coming and how to deal with it. The next thing, leaders of the new world order, dear firstborn of Satan, you've made your plans to wed the world to be your bride. However, she has called off the engagement. I, God 3D, have declared the wedding plans you've worked so long and hard to prepare are now null and void. Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but just this weekend, there was a large gathering in New York, and there was a lot of concerts going on, Lady Gaga, Keith Urban, and a bunch of other different entertainers, all giving praises to who, which is the initials for uh, world, the World Health Organization, that has severely uh, made a bad judgment in their call on this whole thing with the coronavirus. It also is saying that there are those who have been planning for the last over 40 years to put us all under one world government. We know that. We've heard that before. And what God's saying is he's going to take it apart. He's going to step right in, and it's going to bust all wide open. And it's probably going to have a lot to do with what's been going on here just of late. So that you know what that means. Enemies of the body of Christ, throw your fit, call up your armies, threaten me if you will soon. You will witness an ugly scene that you cannot prepare for. My invisible warriors will invade your lands, sight unseen, striking deep into your hearts. You evildoers will scream in fear, staring into hollowed eyes that reveal unconscionable disparity, measured at a level unknown and never heard of before. Now, what God's talking about here, he's talking about how he's going to retaliate against those nations and those groups, that faction of people who have tried their best to put us all under their thumb, so to speak, taking control of what belongs to God, including his people. God's about to come to our aid and defense. It's been a long time coming. It's been a long time coming to see our Lord step up and do something of this magnitude. Now, you might say, well, Brother Kent, you know, you, you, you really are getting way out there, you know. Well, let me just say this. When October 13th came and I, I gave that word that the Lord had about what was going to take place, and it was going to take place very soon, I, and in fact, the Lord said it's already started, and that was October 13th. He said that, that this disease is already out there. This virus is coming, and it's coming, and the reason why he said it's coming was in that word too. Now, we made a big deal of putting that out to you in a couple of different email blasts that we sent out, but we wanted you to know that these things weren't just made up or cultivated out after the fact. Eric did a lot of work uh, going back and getting the timestamps of all the different places where we posted it, which was YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook, um, you know, there's Vimo. There was a lot of places that had the dates on their emails that were sent out. The email address is on there. The email date is on there. So we know, uh, you know, that we got more than enough proof that this was just not something made up after the fact. It could have been. But you think about what was being said at that particular point in time. That was so far out there. People thought, what? What are you talking about, man? Now, listen to me. I don't give words all the time. I don't just do hit and miss. I don't just get out there and start blurting something and just hope it happens. No, I'm not. that's not who Kent Simpson is. That's not how God raised me up. I, 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 like I told you earlier today, I have, I've only probably given maybe three words that are dealing with our nation or the church at large. I don't do this often. I don't do this until God tells me to. In fact, when I did that first one, October 13th, there was five things that God had given me that particular week. But I was not at liberty to share all five. I could only share that one. 
This is the second of the five. So we know we got three more things that God's going to release for me to give you when he's ready to do it. And I don't do it beforehand. I know better than that. I've, I've had enough whoopings by the chastening hand of God for doing get ahead of him. I don't get ahead of him. I wait on him, definitely. I mean, it's, it's the only right thing to do. Now, let's get back to the rest of that word because you, you need to see the rest of this. All right. We're at um, the enemies, our enemy's economy. Now, I think you're going to know who this is, but I'll, I'll tell you afterwards. Even dragons eventually lose their fire. Your GNP, which is your gross national product, will spring a leak, and all your fuel for war will deplete. Slide your beads on your abascus back and forth with no gain. Now, you'll understand what abascus is in just a minute. No matter how you calculate it, calculates the word, you will lose. You have kicked the hornet's nest and stirred the sting of death. From the north, south, east, and west, the people will say they once were the best. Now, you know who he's talking about. If you don't, let me just say it. It, 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 it starts with a C. And it goes H-I-N-A, okay? And that, that particular GNP is 17%, the highest in the world. But God's saying that they're the dragon, <laughs> referencing to China, is going to lose their fire. They're going to spring a leak, and their economy is going to just deplete. And it'll go fast. It'll go supernaturally. Not just because of the United States, not just because of what the president does. It's going to be because of what God does. In fact, the least amount that we get involved in all this as a nation of people, the more God will reveal himself. If we try to get in there and do something, it's going to look like we did it, not God. And the God doesn't want that. He wants us to stand down and watch and wait. So hopefully that's what will happen. Now, the last part of this, last paragraph of this. Getting closer to the end. When your back is broken, dream shattered, your people lost and powerless, your barking threats will have no bite. When you've totally helpless, my people will cry out to me in prayer, interceding on your behalf, calling for repentance. My entreated spirit, in other words, we have pulled on his spirit. We have entreated his spirit with prayer until he released. He said, my spirit will release unto your hands, will be released into your hands, and my church will march through the nations, cleansing your people with the sacred blood of my son, Christ Jesus, I, your G3D, will call you my bride, and nothing will take you from me again. Now, I have copies of this. If you want a copy of it, I'll be glad to. Just email me and let me know. I'll send you a digital copy. You can print it up if you have Microsoft Word. It'll print up on your computer or maybe even on your device. I use I have Microsoft Word on my cell phone even, so I can read documents when people send me stuff. Um, I want to say something else about this. I've been using this G3D for some for the last few weeks now, and I've sat on this for a, a number of months because uh, Melissa Cheatham brought it to me, and I, I, she brought it to me through an email or a chat or something. I forgot how she got to me with it, but but it it resonated with my spirit because I, you know people are confused. When you say there's only one God, they don't understand what you talk about. We refer to God and we think which God is it? Is it God's Son? God's Father? God, the Holy Spirit, which God are you talking about? Well, when we say G3D, we're trying to make it more simplified that God is three parts in one. Not three people, not three separate people. No, he's only God the, God the Son is the body of God. God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the Spirit of God. And God the will, the Father, is the will of God. God the Father is the will. The mind, will, and emotions of God. How he thinks. You know, your mind thinks and your mind controls your body. Your mind, your mind controls your thoughts. Your mind is what makes decisions. But it's your body usually that goes through the acts of doing things as the Holy Spirit or your spirit or your nervous system, you might say, goes through your body to tell your hand to move, your legs to move, whatever else needs to move, your mouth, or, you know, wiggle your nose, or whatever it is you're going to do. It first has to start within the concordance of the will of that person. Whether you will to serve God or not serve God, I pray you do serve God. Because I tell you people, these times are perilous. And what's yet ahead of us is still going to be challenging. But let me promise you this. If you pray, 
if you hear and you obey, you will be in the will of God. And 1 John 5 and 18 says, if you are in the will of God, the evil one can't touch you. And that's what I'm doing with the best of my abilities to get you to the place to where you can pray, hear, and obey. And that you will be able to know exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, I'm going to finish up this month of April with the last part, the last episode of this series of Confessions of a Prophet. And we're going to start a new series starting next month, next the first part of May, the first Sunday of May, will be on Pray, Hear, and Obey. Now, I know there's at least nine episodes in that particular series, but the point is this, is I'm going to walk you through some things on prayer, walk you through some information you need to know about hearing God, and some information you know about obeying God. Because a lot of people think they know. But if you know, why isn't it working? Truth always works. So if you've got some kind of half-truth working in your doctrine, then you're probably not going to get what you really need to know. But when you're working with God, for God, in God's will, everything else begins to fall in place. <laughs> I'll just share something with you. I think I can do this if i got enough time here. Yeah, I think we got enough time. Today was kind of an interesting day this morning. Um, you know, there's been a lot going on this last few weeks. Even though we've been quarantined, we've been really doing a lot. You know, a lot of people needing prayer, a lot of people needing counseling. Uh, so we really hadn't slowed down at all. And, and it's really kind of put me in a place to where sometimes I'd be carrying so much load of depression off people that I would carry it on me and I would really have a hard time. So when I'd go get my coffee in the morning when I drive, eight miles into town to where I get coffee. I'd play praise and worship music, you know, just trying to get my spirit back up. Today, going going up there, I just didn't wasn't really getting anything out of the music. And sitting in line to drive through to get my coffee, I kept trying different CDs, and, you know, nothing was doing anything for me. And I realized, wait a minute, I need to pray. God's not letting me do this for a reason. Now i got to find out what it is. So, when I got my coffee, I took off down the road, and I started praying in the Spirit. And I hadn't got two miles down the road, and this is what God said. He said, prayer is an envelope of prosperity just waiting to be opened. Think about that. Prayer is an envelope of prosperity just waiting to be opened. Now, that sounds strange maybe to you, but the fact is, to me at the time, it just really, really spoke volumes. Not only did it speak to me, I got a whole sermon coming out of that through this series that I'm going to do next, starting next May, coming this May. So, and I, and I say that because if you know how to pray, prosperity means help along the journey. We need prosperity in health right now. We need prosperity in new jobs. We need prosperity in getting old jobs kicked up and going again, uh, and even businesses running again. We need all kinds of prosperity in the nation now because our GMP just busted loose and just drained right out on the floor. We need to rebuild, so we need prosperity. We're going to find out how to do that, and for you personally, too. Supernaturally, I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, you know, just working harder. I'm talking about working smarter. And that's the way God wants us to do it, to work smarter, not just harder. I'm going to leave you today, and I pray that you've gotten something out of this. And let me just say again, if you want to email me, you can email me at prophetsimpson at gmail.com or at pmtkent at aol.com. And that way you can I can download a copy to you, and I don't mind doing that for you so that you got it. And it's dated, so, you know, everybody will know when you got it. Now, just hang on to it for a while. Don't go out there and share it with everybody. You, you'll, you'll probably embarrass yourself. Or get a hold of somebody that probably wants to really get you down and out and make you all depressed and everything by chewing on you. You know, just, just let it sit there for a while. Let it simmer. Wait until the Spirit of God moves you to do that. Would you do that? Just wait on Him to give you such a burning unction in the bones that you know you got to do it. Don't do it just because it'd be the thing to do. That's just not right. I mean, and I don't care if you put your name on it. It doesn't make me any difference at all. My thing is, is get the message out when the time's right. I gave it to you for a purpose because you're one of us. You're one of the prophetic people. Not everybody understands prophetic people. <laughs> We're probably the most misunderstood people there are in the body of Christ. But that's okay. We'll hang together. We'll make it together. Y'all be blessed today. Don't forget us now. I'm looking for campus partners. 
I'd really like to have some more campus partners because I really, really want to start pouring more into your life and into what you do. Now, some people who have been family partners, ministry partners, they always give more than the, the minimum. And so I automatically throw them on my list of campus partners, whether they signed up for it or not, because they always give that and more. Y'all be blessed. Let God take care of the rest. Until then, I'll see you next week.